and gentlemen, James Rosen. Jim. I wanted to acknowledge several people today that I grew up with. Of course, Bill Wright, I Lit, Ed Hurst, some of the great broadcast personalities that played the music that I grew up with and that were responsible for the success of so many artists. WIBG was my station. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's nice that you could be here today. Um, <clears throat> this book <clears throat> I love doing because it takes you back to a simpler, gentler, more innocent time in the late 50s and early 60s when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, listening to Hi, Bill, Joe Niagara, God rest his soul, Harvey Miller, Tom Donahue, all the great DJs at WIBG, uh, listening to Ed Hurst and Joe Grady, watching them on TV at summertime on the pier. Um, and I just had to do this book. So it truly was a, a source of enjoyment. And now, because of the great sex Charlie Gracie had in Europe, in England in particular, Germany, Belgium, many of the countries, the book is now in England, in, in Munich, Germany, selling. So thank you, Charlie. Um, how did it get started? Well, rock and roll music, as we know, began really as a variation of the R&B music in the 1940s. Uh, Louis Jordan was a man who came to Philadelphia from the Deep South and formed the Jump Blues, which was a combo, a group, a guitar player, a, a bass fiddle player, a piano player, uh, a drummer, a saxophonist. They played a very kind of spirited music. They called it the Jump Blues. Um, they had a boogie-woogie type backbeat. And uh, this music was very popular, but <clears throat> some of the middle-class America people were somewhat taken aback by it because some of the lyrics were somewhat suggestive. Today we may go, ah, but at that time, you know, when Joe Turner sh sang Shake, Rattle, and Roll and he talked about the sun shining through uh, a woman's dress, Bill Haley came along and covered the song and he would take that lyric and rewrite, rewrite, rewrite it and then talk about a woman getting out of the kitchen and getting away from the pots and pans. Well, Bill Haley wound up selling a million copies of Shake, Rattle, and Roll. So that was an example. Anyway, in the early 1950s, the, the, the kids in this country, they didn't want to listen to Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby or <clears throat> Perry Como or Patti Page. So they began to listen to the R&B artists. Well, middle class America didn't find that quite acceptable. They looked for an alternative. So what they did is, a lot, of, a lot of artists began to spring up who may have covered the music to some extent, but with more palatable lyrics, and also added a characteristic of their own. The music began to become less maybe saxophone and horn driven like the jump blues artists, and it was more guitar and drum driven. So in 1951, of course, Charlie Gracie, he was about 15 years old, he recorded Boogie Woogie Blues, and that really began to kick things off um, and then in 1953, Alan Freed was at a concert with Bill Haley out in Cleveland, and uh, Bill Haley was playing a song, We're Gonna Rock the Joint Tonight. Well, Alan Freed was very taken with the lyrics, you know, we're gonna rock, rock, rock everybody, we're gonna roll, roll, roll everybody. So at one point, he said to the audience, all right, ready, we're gonna rock and roll to Bill Haley's Rock the Joint. Well, he must have played the song 15 times. People began to call in for the rock and roll tune. And that was how the term got popularized. Although the term rock and roll, of course, existed in the R&B movement in the 40s and even the 30s. Uh, you had people like Roy Brown with a hit recording saying, we're going to rock all night long, or Winoni Harris, we're going to rock and roll tonight. It meant something different, of course, but if the term was coined in the 40s, the late 30s, with the R&B artists, it was popularized in the early 50s. Well, an interesting thing happened. After Charlie had recorded Woogie Woogie Blues and began to bring attention to rock and roll uh, and began to record on the 20th Century label, the Cadillac label, uh, Bill Haley had some ses success with Crazy Man Crazy. Um, he had a group called The Saddleman. He was from nearby Chester by way of Michigan. And he renamed his group The Comets, Bill Haley and his Comets. And he had this success with Crazy Man Crazy. He began to catch on. Uh, he moved from uh, Essex Records to Decca Records, and he had Shake, Rattle, and Roll. 
and he had Dim Dim the Lights. Both sold a million copies in 1954. But at that time still, pop music was the thing. That's what Bob Horn was playing on bandstand. That's what a lot of the radio stations were playing. That's uh, what, what was, was occurring. Um, well, uh, in 1954, they recorded a song called 13 Women and Only One Man in Town. They must have spent nine hours recording it. The flip side was a song called We're Gonna Rock Around the Clock Tonight. Well, they spent maybe a half hour and did it like that. Both songs came out and they took a nosedive. Uh, they went on to record more, more hits. Uh, then a curious thing happened in California. They were making a movie. Richard Brooks, a Philadelphian, by the way, was directing a picture called The Blackboard Jungle, a movie about troubled and disadvantaged kids in a high school. Juvenile delinquency was a big topic in 1955. Well. <clears throat> He went to Glenn Ford's house. Glenn Ford played the teacher, Edward Dottier. He was the star of the film with Sidney Poitier, Anne Francis, Vic Morrow, God rest his soul, and Paul Mazursky, who later became a, a very well-known director. Um, and he was visiting Glenn Ford, and he heard his nine-year-old son, Peter, playing this, this music that they called rock and roll music. He said, who is that? Well, that's a group from the Philadelphia area. And he said, what is that? It's a catchy tune. He says, well, it's going to, we're going to rock around the clock tonight. We're going to rock. Well, he went on and on. Richard Brooks said to Glenn Ford and Peter Ford, can I borrow this record? And they looked at each other and said, sure, why not? Well, he took the record back to MGM. He listened to it with his assistant director, Joel Freeman, and he made Rock Around the Clock, the theme song of the Blackboard Jungle. Well, that March or April, it opened in 1955, just about 50 years ago, and it created a furor. Rock Around the Clock, which had been recorded a year and a half before, which was Dead as a Doornail, became the number one song in the country, the number one song in Europe, the number, the number one song in the world. I think to this day there have been 200 million copies and variations sold of We're Gonna Rock Around the Clock Tonight, recorded by Bill Haley and his Comets in 1954, and released as a, as, a, as, a, as a big blunder, supposedly. Kids were dancing in the aisles. There were riots at drive-in theaters. It truly revolutionized the music industry. In 1956, of course, Charlie Gracie recorded Butterfly. He sold a million copies, then two million, then three million. He followed that up with, uh, it was actually a double-sided hit, 99 Ways, and then the recording Fabulous. So it was Charlie that really allowed Bernie Lowe and Cameo Records to prosper and then spawn the careers of Bobby Rydell, Chubby Checker, the Dovells, the Orlons, the Times, Dee Dee Sharp. Mm -hmm. That was Charlie uh, really having the success with those three records. He later became, of course, a big recording star in England, uh, had many, many uh, top 10 and top 20 hits there. I love you so much it hurts, Wander and Eyes. So we certainly owe a great deal to Charlie Gracie and Bill Haley and his Comets for really revolutionizing the music industry and creating rock and roll. And then, of course, um, High Lit, Bill Wright, Joe Niagara, uh, and company for coming along in the late 50s and doing so much for so many of the artists in Philadelphia, for so many of them, helping them and playing the records and having the awareness, along with Dick Clark, to really know what the music was and recognize and the teenagers in America, and, the, and, and paying respect to what was happening and giving them a voice. So I salute you gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs> Ed Hurst, the pioneer of it all, who in 1946 began with Joe Grady. Um, I can't say enough about Ed Hurst because long before Bob Horn and American Bandstand, there was Ed Hurst and Joe Grady in the 950 Club. They were the first broadcasters to allow teenagers to dance to music on the air. Um, they would have guests on the air. Um, when uh, the kids stuffed the mailboxes and jammed the elevators in one building, Ed Hurst said, that's okay, we'll move somewhere else. So they moved to another building, and there they had a luncheon ed, and they had a studio, and they had an auditorium. Um, it wasn't long before that that WFIL wanted Grady and Hurst to come to their station and do a new show, which, which really would become Bandstand, which they would simulcast Monday through Friday. Well, uh, Ed and Joe had a show that on the Hooper Pulse ratings was beating the soap operas, 
was the number one uh, show in, in, in Philadelphia. It was the rage. So naturally, WFIL said, let's get Grady and Hearst to host this show. We'll simulcast it Monday through Friday on TV and radio. And they called him in. Um, I believe it was Roger Clip. Mm -hmm. They walked into his office. And um, they were told they would start in two weeks. Well, Roger Clift asked for uh, Ed and Joe's salary demands, and they adjourned the meeting. Well, the ride back to WPN, Ed was, what, 19 or 20 years old. He was very elated. Here, he and Joe were going to have the chance to do a simulcast, a radio and TV show, five days a week. Well, Joe Grady had this long face, so Ed looked at him. He said, whoa, what's with you? He said, do you really think that WPEN is going to let us out of our contract? Well, Ed was very optimistic at around age 20, and he couldn't see anything but the best happening. So I'll talk to them. It'll be okay. They'll, they'll be happy to, to help us. Well, they went back to the studio. They explained, uh, Ed explained to the uh, general manager the wonderful opportunity that awaited them at WFIL. And uh, the general manager, whomever he talked to, said, um, um, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Well, the next day, Ed got a call from the program director at WFIL, and he said, Ed said, I'll never forget his words. He said, gentlemen, I think this is not a propitious time to bring you boys over to WFIL. <laughs> what had happened was Bill Silk, the owner of the Sunray Drugs, the parent company of WPEN, had called Walter Annenberg, who was a very powerful man uh, and the owner of WFIL, and said, if you attempt to raid our talent pool, if you attempt to take Ed Hurst and Joe Crady away from WPEN, I will personally withdraw $1 million worth of, it, of it endorsements from the Philadelphia Inquirer and give them to the Philadelphia Bulletin. Is that understood? <laughs> and Mr. Annenberg said, uh, yes, that is understood. Mm. Well, that was the end of that. Of course, um, uh, Joe and Ed continued with WPN. They eventually went on television, WRCV. They eventually uh, had many other television shows, and then, of course, uh, established themselves in 1958 at summertime on the beer, and were on for 20 years every summer. Um, uh, one of the great broadcasting duos, Grady and Hearst, the true pioneers of radio and TV uh, dance programs. <laughs> An interesting happened uh, after Charlie and Bill Haley's success, you had Artie Singer, who was a friend, Lenny with Dick Clark, uh, Dave White had written a song with a group called the Juveneers. They took it to Artie, uh, Artie took it to Dick Clark, it was called Let's All Do the Bop. Dick Clark said, nah, this doesn't work because the bop is, is, is out of date. That's what the California kids do, they don't do that anymore. So he suggested to Artie Singer, why don't you retitle the song and change the lyrics. Well, Artie Singer jumped in the car and claims that between WFIL and WPEN in, in Center City, he rewrote the, the entire song, and now it was called At the Hop, because at that time, I and Bill and Joe were all doing, uh, in addition to being on the air, were doing record hops, and tons of teenagers were coming to see them do the record hops. Well, uh, he rewrote the song, uh, he took Danny Rapp and put him on the lead. They changed their name to Danny and the Juniors. Uh, Dick Clark played the song a month or two later at the end of 1957, and At the Hop sold millions of records. It really uh, cemented Philadelphia as one of the great you know, music capitals in the world. They followed that up with Rock and Roll is Here to Stay, um, and, and, and among other hits. So Artie Singer, you have to give credit to, aside from being a great voice teacher, uh, with Bernie Lowe, they owned the music school together and teaching all of the wonderful singers in Philadelphia from Al Martino and Jimmy Darren and uh, Bobby Rydell on, um, he, had, he had the foresight to, to, to rewrite the song and, and get behind Danny and the Juniors and make them an institution. Um, another, another man it, it played a huge part in making Philadelphia the city of music and helping to put rock and roll on the map along with Joe and Ed, Bob Horn, who, who you must give a lot of credit to for, for creating Bandstand and doing what he did, and then Dick Clark for seeing that the teenage America would love this and allowing all the music to be played at the same time all across the country. You have to give credit to Bob Marcucci. Bob Marcucci was a guy that grew up in South Philadelphia, loved rock and roll music, loved pop music. 
he, he envisioned this world a bigger, bigger place than the one he grew up in. So he took a record shop in an open air market. He, uh, he would write songs with his partner, Peter DeAngelis. They would re play the songs as the people came in. He would sing and dance to them. This inspired the movie The Idol Maker with Ray Sharkey many years later. And um, uh, he got things going. Well, he wanted to form a record company. So uh, he needed the title. He found the title, the Chancellor Hotel. That was where his brother worked as a raider. So he created Chancellor Records based on the Chancellor Hotel where his brother worked. And he would slip into the dining room when his brother was setting up the tables. And uh, that's where he would do a lot of his correspondence. He discovered a girl named Jody Sands. He and Peter DeAngelis wrote a song called With All My Heart, which became a hit song, I believe, 1957. That, of course, I and Bill played and helped make a hit. <clears throat> then he said, this is not enough. I would like to go somewhere, and I would like to, to create some more of these rock and roll artists and manage them, along with writing songs and hopefully producing them. Well, he went to see a group perform, um, uh, Rocco and the Saints. Uh, they were okay, but he didn't see anybody that really knocked them out. Well, he was just getting ready to leave, and this young fella, his name was, I think, Francis Avalone, he stood up and he began to sing. He was the trumpet player. Well, Bob Marcucci's mouth dropped open. He says, this kid really has it. So he said, excuse me, but uh, would you consider recording a song? And uh, Francis, Francis Avalone, who called himself Frankie Avalon's response was, me? I'm a trumpet player. And Bob Marcucci said, oh, 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 I assure you, you're much more than that. Took him back to the studio. They recorded several songs. He and Peter DeAngelis took him to the record hops, correct? And uh, they built a teenage fan base. And before you know it, <clears throat> Frankie Avalon had, between 1958 and 1962, he had 10 top 10 hits. Um, his, after some moderate hits, he recorded a song called Dee Dee Dinah. I love my Dinah. Oh, Dee Dee Dinah. Well, he had a cold that day, and he recorded the song. And uh, in, a, in a joking fashion, he went like this. So when he was singing, oh, Dee Dee Dinah, I love my Dinah. Well, when he got done, he must have, you know, think, what did I do? Let's record it again. Bob Marcucci said, no, that's terrific. Bob Marcucci's partner came in and said, that's awful. What did you do? Let's record it again. Bob Marcucci said, we can't. We don't have enough money to go back and record the song again. There they were, late 1957. They had spent all their money recording Dee Dee Dinah, and no one knew what was going to, be hap was going to happen to this nasalized version of Frankie Avalon's song. Well... If I'm, if I'm correct, a couple of months later, hi, Bill, he, Dick Clark played the song, right? You played it on the radio. And what happened? It became... Monster. It became a monster. It became a million seller, the nasalized version of D.D. Dinah. Um, Frankie Avalon was well on his way. Uh, Bob Marcucci was not content. He went out into the neighborhood, and he wanted to find another young man. Well, he was driving down the street in South Philadelphia in 1958. He saw an ambulance parked in front of his friend's house parked the car, was very much alarmed, walked over, rushed over, and to his relief, although it still was a tragic circumstance, the ambulance was wheeling out his friend's next door neighbor, Dominic Forte. On the stoop of Dominic Forte's house was young Fabiano Forte, who was 14 and a half years old. Well, I don't know exactly, there's, there's different variations about what happened, but it's been said that you know, Bob at some point had uh, uh, approached young Fabian about being a, the next teenage idol. He was not very interested in Bob Marcucci's promises of teenage stardom. In fact, in no uncertain terms, he told Bob Cucci, Marcucci where to go. But Bob Marcucci was a very persistent fellow, and he knew that Fabian had the qualities, had the charisma, and would become the next teenage idol. He was right. At one point, Fabian, to his credit, put his family before himself. He had a disabled father, he had a mother, he had two younger brothers, so he jumped into a business that was intimidating to recording artists much older than he. And he succeeded. He had 20 uh, uh, top, top 10 hits in two years, or 10 top 10 hits in two years. Um, uh, and then he became a very, very good actor. Uh, in the early 60s, of course, Fabian and Frankie Avalon were placed under contract to 20th Century Fox. So the two of them and Marcucci uh, moved to California. They never came back, really. Uh, Frankie Avalon's first movie was with Alan Ladd, Guns of the Timberland. 
and then Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea with Joan Fontaine, Peter Lorre, Walter Pigeon, Robert Sterling, Barbara Eden. Uh, he was well on his way. Then the beach films with Annette Funicello. Fabian made a picture called North to Alaska with John Wayne and Stuart Granger and Ernie Kovacs, a great Philadelphian, a great comedic talent that left us too early. Uh, Capuchin, directed by Henry Hathaway, who was a very, very established director. Uh, he went on to do High Time with Bing Crosby, um, Little Dear Brigitte with James Stewart and Marino O'Hara. So Fabian made 30 feature films. He became a very good actor. And that is a, a success story for the idol and the idol maker, Bob Marcucci, Frankie Avalon, and Fabian. Um, in the early 60s, of course, Bobby Rydell, who grew up as a, uh, who did impersonations and watched Gene Krupa play the drums as a five-year-old and became a great drummer. He would go to the Earl Theater with his dad and when he was five years old, and he said, this is what I want to do. And his dad said, yes, okay. He became a great, great musician. Uh, in 1959, um, uh, someone saw him play drums and perform, uh, took him around. There were no takers. Bernie Lowe, who had had success now with Cameo because of Charlie Gracie, saw Bobby Rydell, remembered him from Paul Whiteman's TV Teen Club, and uh, gave him a contract. Bobby Rydell, within a year, was one of the top recording artists in the country. He wound up having three million sellers, Volari, uh, Wild One, Forget Him, which he recorded in England. Uh, Bobby Rydell can still fill a voice with his uh, fill a room with his voice, wouldn't you say, Charlie? Uh, still, a, it could have been a big band singer, I think, had he come along earlier. Um, uh, a great performer, very down to earth, unassuming man, a, a true Philadelphian, Bobby Rydell. Chubby Checker was a man that worked in a poultry shop, and he was very um, had a great personality. He would entertain the, the troops, and um, he eventually got a contract with Cameo Records, and um, he recorded a song called "The Class." It was impersonations, and then uh, Dave Apple, uh, who was a, a brilliant man, who. Uh, Wrote, who recorded many, many songs and was a, a musician and engineer for Cameo, and then at Cameo Parkway, uh, said, why don't we try The Twist? The Twist was a record that was recorded by Hank Ballard, who was a rhythm and blues artist. It had a, it had a very hard driving rhythmic sound. It was on the charts, and Dick Clark had played it, but it wasn't a great success. Well, Chubby Checker recorded The Twist in 1960. It was more, more celebratory. It was more happy-go-lucky. And everybody could do it, you know. They, they likened doing the twist to drying your, your rear end with a towel, you know, after you got out of the shower. Well, anyway, Chubby Checker had the number one record in the country and the world with a twist. Then Dave Apple and uh, Cal Mann wrote Let's Twist Again, and that was a big hit, a number one hit. And they weren't done with the twist because Bernie Lowe re-released the twist a year and a half later, and it again became the number one record in the country. So very unusual that the twist had two stops at the top a year and a half apart. Uh, Chubby Checker, of course, became the innovator of a lot of dance crazes, the limbo, the pony, the hucklebuck. Um, he had a solid six or seven year career. He still is very active in concert today. Also one of the great rock and roll legends, uh, Chubby Checker. Uh, many of the other recording artists in the early 60s, the Times, who had one of the great romantic ballads of all time, So Much In Love, Wonderful, Wonderful, uh, the Dovells with the Bristol Stomp and You Can't Sit Down, Dee Dee Sharp with the Mashed Potatoes, uh, had a great voice, um, the Orlans with South Street and um, Wawa Tusi. These were all groups from Cameo Parkway, Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells recorded. I can't leave out probably one of the greatest voices who I really think High Lit was really instrumental in helping his career, and that's Lee Andrews, Lee Andrews and the Hearts. Mm. And he owes a great debt to, to High Lit. Who, who recognized this man's talent. I would say most historians will agree that Lee Andrews had probably one of the greatest, smoothest, most melodious voices ever to come out of Philadelphia, ever to come out of anywhere. Lee Andrews and the Hearts. What a great artist, Lee Andrews, and I have to pay tribute to him. Um, these were the great artists that I wrote about. Of course, in 1964, Bernie Lowe, um, his Cameo Records began to come asunder. A lot of the artists did not have hits. You had the British Invasion. Doo-wop, which was group harmony, began to uh, decrease in popularity. The early R&B music that we knew, the rock and roll music with the, the fundamental backbeat uh, of the late 50s and early 60s uh, began to lose its flavor. The Beatles took over 60% of the playlist uh, were the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, right? The, um, 
Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Dave Clark Five, Freddie and the Dreamers, you name it. Um, and also at the same time, there was the ascension of Motown. And as Joe Niagara says in the book, it really was a sophisticated uh, sound over what we had been experiencing previously. And the older people, the people now in their 20s and 30s, were listening to the Supremes and Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and the Four Tops and Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and saying, hey, that's a good song, as opposed to the teenagers that love the music that Bill and Hi and Joe and Harvey and Tom played in the late 50s and early 60s, which really was the music. So music was changing. And uh, so with the event of the British and the the, uh, the Motown industry assembled by Barry Gordy and the Funk Brothers. Um, the music changed. Bernie Lowe's company was sold. Dick Clark moved Bandstand, American Bandstand, to California at the beginning of 1964. And the city of music became very quiet. And it remained quiet until the late 60s with Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, and Tom Bell, and Linda Creed, God rest her soul, who brought in a new sound, the Philly Soul Sound and ushered in all these wonderful groups, the Delphonics, the, the Intruders, who were really the, one of the first groups to give rise to Philly Soul, um, the Stylistics, uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Nuts, who had recorded, what, 1959, 1960, My Hero, is that something, is that right? Yeah. Um, and now had Teddy Pendergrass, and now are billed as Harold Melvin and the Blue Nuts. Uh, these groups were fantastic. They had a very sophisticated sound, and whereas in the 60s, at one point it had been relegated to the keyboard and the drums and the, and the bass, now you had the horns, the French horns with the Delphonics, and you had uh, the Spinners and the, the, uh, the OJs, all these other groups coming to Philadelphia. They were not Philadelphia groups like the ones I mentioned, but they came and recorded for uh, Kenny Gamble and Leon Hoff. So Kenny Gamble and Leon Hoff, Tom Bell, Leon McCree, uh, great music people who ushered in a great new era of Philly soul, and it, it, and it went on from there. So music has changed. You've seen the variations from the R&B to the rock and roll to uh, the British to uh, the Philly soul music. But truly, Philadelphia has been a great, great uh, city of music. And I'm, I'm very honored that, that Bill and, and I and Ed Hurst could be here today, Charlie Gracie and Joan Gracie, two dear people uh, who I'm very privileged to be have become friends with. and, and Thank you so much for what you did for my book, Ed and Charlie, and Charlie Jr., you're a prince of a man. Uh, Bill Weber, who I grew up with watching on, radio, on television, and uh, Joe Pellegrino, and, and of course Tommy McCarthy, our contemporary now, and, and, and across the street. Uh, and thank you, Pat Delcy. Um, and I gotta say, and last thing, I have to say, pay tribute to another gentleman that came here because I was here. That is the Dean of Broadcasting, Bill Campbell. Um, I did two documentaries for Channel 12 and, and uh, WVLT, uh, LVT in Allentown, and they were on the Philadelphia Warriors and the Philadelphia Athletics. I was fortunate to have Bill Campbell as my narrator, and what a, what a, what a, a touch of class he added to both documentaries. And there was no other person that we ever c considered, and we were lucky to, to, to call him up and have Bill say, yeah, I, I knew a little something about the A's and the Warriors. I can help you out. <laughs> and, and help us out, he did. Bill, you, uh, thank you so much for all the Phillies and the Eagles and the Warriors. And you are a prince of a man. Thank you. Go keep it. A couple of things. First of all, questions. We can open up for questions. You might have some. I have a question. Like uh, Pat mentioned that you did a book on the spas. Yes, right here. Oh, OK. And it, that's available in stores? We're going to sell it today for $10. The proceeds from that book and this book are not going to me. Uh, they're going to go to uh, the uh, American Red Cross for the relief fund and also to the Sunny Hill Basketball League. Sunny Hill is a dynamic person, and uh, he has done a lot for uh, people in Philadelphia, and, and he and John Cheney have done a lot for the, the youth of Philadelphia to take them off the street and do uh, a basketball camp at what he calls Little Hawaii and Temple University Ambler, and also to have this basketball league. And uh, so I'm, I'm donating a, a, a good amount to Sonny's League and also to the American Red Cross. Not, not only is he donating money to that, but because of uh, his being here today, uh, this runs for, what, 15, 16 bucks or something. Uh, you, if you wish, you'll be able to get one for $10, and you'll also get his signature. Right. What, what a historical uh, yeah. man this yes. guy is. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> 
Bill Wright. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, I am Bill Wright, and I'm grateful to be a 50-year part of the, the Philadelphia broadcast and music scene. It, it seems God, half a century. And you really, really touch my heart so many ways because I know every person that you spoke of, including my dear, dear friend here. But I wonder if you ever heard this, and that I and I have talked about this a number of times. If Frank Rizzo had lived, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame would have wound up in South yes, Philadelphia sure. instead of Wilson Good letting it go out the window yes. just because Alan Freed had said rock and roll in Cleveland. It's, a, it's still a travesty. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, re I read where Kenny Gamble is bringing the R&B Hall to, to Philadelphia yeah. from New York. Yeah. Yeah. But I, everybody I talked to would say to me, the book is for sale in the gift shop at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, when I talked to them, I said to the distributor, how many copies did they order? Mm -hmm. Well, they only ordered a half a dozen copies. I said, how come? He said, because no one ever goes there. Uh, <laughs> uh, really? Uh, They've been having trouble. Uh, yeah. Doesn't mean anything there. Could they possibly move it yeah. to here? Yeah, I wish. But it is a travesty. Yeah, it is a travesty. Yes. Well, I, I thought there was talk about opening something like that here. Is there, is it still in the uh, I don't know. The only thing that I read yesterday in the paper was that Kenny Gamble was bringing the R&B uh, Hall to Philadelphia, and they were going to make a big thing of it here. They were going to have award ceremonies here, and and uh, so hats off to him for doing that. Wes, uh, I have a friend who wrote the most popular song of all time. You made reference to several times today, and that song, from what I understand, is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What song is that? Rock Around the Clock. Oh, yeah. Well, it's I, supposed to be the most popular song of all time. More well, it is. Recording artists yeah. and everything of any song. That's the national anthem. And a friend of mine mm -hmm. wrote it. Jimmy and Knight. Get, uh, uh, Jimmy Knight. Okay. I, that's not his real name, but no, I know. Yeah, I've asked a lot of people who wrote that song, and none of them ever mentioned it. Yeah, they don't know that. Yeah, uh, Jimmy Knight. Jimmy yeah. Myers. Oh, Jimmy Myers. Yeah. Jimmy Myers. Yeah. yeah. Around 1950, 51, something like that, maybe 52. Because there's someone recorded the song originally that was obscure. Do you, do you, do Bill, uh, hi, you know about that? It was recorded, an obscure version, like the first, Ed, you, you know? It was an obscure version, I think. I think Jimmy had a, a small group in South Jersey. Uh, I don't think they ever sold any records, but yeah. someone actually did, like in 1952, record it. It just did, it was very obscure. Bill Haley worked at the Andy's Log Cabin in South Jersey, which was a joint, you know, a bar club for years long before the record. He had a place in, Ch in Chester, too. And he was from Chester, yeah. What were you going to say, Charlie? The obscure version was by Sunny Day and the Nights. Sunny Day and the Nights. Oh, right. oh okay, all right. And when were we were at least a couple years before? It was after your father's Boogie Woogie Blues, I know that. Yes. Um, Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Where do you see music going today? You've got, to me, such a hodgepodge. I mean, you've got the traditionalists like uh, the Diana Crawls, uh, even some Nora Jones. You've got uh, a girl band. You've got Bocelli. You've got Mario Lanza. Now you've got rap. I mean, where the hell are we? I mean, it's almost like uh, oh, it's all jumbled now. It, it, it really is a, a hodgepodge. Charlie uh, Gracie and I talked about that once, and he talked about the difference when he actually recorded and, and the music years l later that followed. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, I don't know. I, I know that I think different people identify with different music. You know, when I talk to 20-year-old kids about, you know, the music of the 50s, you know, they look at me, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but then again, when I listen to hip-hop and or I don't listen to it because I can't understand the lyrics. I'm a baby boomer, so my generation really uh, still clings to what we can understand. So I think the answer is that, if there is an answer, is that the, the, the younger people have their music, the middle-aged people have their music. I know there's a lot of people that still love popular music. You know, when Ed and Bill and, Tom, and, 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 and both Bills were on WPEN, 
I, I, would, I would find myself turning on that station every afternoon, and I would listen to Hi on WOGL and Tommy, and I listened to them, and uh, so I, I had the pop music and the rock and roll music of the 50s and 60s. That was my bread and butter. But, you know, I, I think different strokes, and uh, I think it's just going to be like that. I, don't, I, I think it will always be like that, I, I, eventually, unless the generations die off. But um, right now, you have, you have your different age groups. You know, but I, I, to be very honest, I, I don't identify with the, the heavy metal and the hip hop, and it, it hurts my. Jimmy Darren, when we were talking the book, he said I don't listen to that music; it hurts my ears. <laughs> so, and he's recording. Jimmy Darren now is is recording pop tunes again. He, yeah. So uh, he has a new CD out tonight. He makes good spaghetti sauce too. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Say it, but as far as hip hop is concerned, what what it's doing to this generation. They're labeling themselves as a generation that is incapable of writing music, mm -hmm. or they just don't want to write music. I mean, anybody can write, you know, words that rhyme and put a drum behind it. I mean, what? Where does that go? I mean, what? How does it? How does it generate? I mean, not it. It sells. That's the biggest thing. Well, yeah, I think fine. I remember, to be honest with you, a lot of adults saying about rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I can't understand the lyrics. They're hard lyrics. They're dirty lyrics, and so on. And people complained, but they went to the record stores in droves and bought millions and millions of some of the songs that were, at that time, considered to be vulgar or whatever. So I, I think it's time up. Anyway, I think Jim ought to be a, a history professor. Yes. He, has, he, has put together, he has put together in these two films here just a, a, a wealth of information about how this got started, rock and roll, and of course, relating to sports, the Spas, which was the forerunner of the Warriors and now the Sixers, and one other item he is writing right now, in process of writing another book, which is going to be involving, for the most part, a lot of Philadelphians, but also some other people from other parts of the country who are in the world of acting. And he is going to be talking to them individually, like he talked to you know Ed and the guys here, about their view of their lives as actors and uh, several people that all of, uh, all of whom we know uh, like Kevin Bacon and he yeah. and several others are going to be uh, the uh, subject matter of his next book so we wish you a lot of luck well, with you. the next one and thank you for being here we want to present it with our broadcast pioneers watch, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we hope that, uh, we'll, that we'll see you here again because it was a good talk yeah, with you. Thank you so much.